Greetings, brothers and sisters. Greetings. Welcome to CIMOTAP, the Committee to Eliminate Media Offensive to African People. Um, how many people are here for their first time? Could I see by a raise of hands? Let's give them a round of applause and thank them for joining us today. We are blessed today to have uh, one of the foremost scholars of our history, one of the foremost authors, educators, and warriors for our people. And he is joining uh, the ranks of many, many other great ones that have been here. And we know the quality of his work, and we know that the fact that so many new people came, that you're aware of his uh, work also. If you look around you, I hope that you feel yourself. These paintings you see over here in the middle, the abstracts, they, they're from a brother, William Osiris Caldwell, who uh, willed them to us when he died. There are other pictures and paintings that have been donated from various sources. In the back, you'll see two large depictions of Pharaoh and the Pharaoh's wife in the back, on, the, on that side of the wall in green. And if you look in the front, uh, if the screen wasn't here, you'll see a Sphinx with a picture of Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinen on one side and a picture of Dr. Clark on the other. And you'll notice that that door in the back is painted a particular way. The cover on the radiator is pr uh, painted uh, in African motifs. The artist who did that is here today with us. I'd like to acknowledge him. Brother Lucian, would you please stand up? I just, it's like a dream. Brother Lucian just came, and in fact, he, we had uh, many of these paintings. There, there's a whole wall of pictures of our African uh, musicians that uh, hasn't been put back up yet. But these things were all lined up by Lucian with uh, using the, um, what do you call the thing, a level and all kinds of things. They've gotten a little out of shape right now, but the design of the whole overall arrangement of our pictures and stuff was done by Brother, Brother Lucian. But I'm afraid that one day Brother Lucian is going to wake up and say, wait a minute, I gave this to these people for free? <laughs> you know? Uh, thank you, Brother. No problem, thank you. That's Sister Yvonne, one of the original members of CMOTAP. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> there are always people working behind the scenes uh, when you go somewhere. When you, has anybody been to the restroom yet? You'll find nice, clean restrooms, right? Somebody clean that, right? They're not standing up here at the mic. Let's give them a round of applause. The floor was um, uh, scraped and, 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 and redone. Somebody did that. He's not standing in front of the mic, right? right. So we give him a round of applause. <laughs> and all of you found out about this somewhere. And we also, we just want to acknowledge all of those people who uh, have made today's program come about. So uh, I was telling you about Brother Lucian. Uh, Brother Lucian came and he's donated these things to CMOTAP for free. And uh, this, was his, this, this Sphinx is really unbelievable. I ask you to come up and take a look at it before you leave uh, so you can uh, just basically see the love uh, that is being shared with you uh, coming from our ancestors. So I'm going to get out of the way through Lucian, of course. <laughs> I'm going to get out of the way. Uh, I think that you came here to see Brother Tony Browder. I'll let you know that you can see him today. You can see him again tomorrow at the Board for the Education for People of African Ancestry in Harlem at 286 Convent Avenue. And that'll be at 3 p.m. That's the John Henry Clark House, 286 
Convent Avenue between 141st and 142nd at 3 p.m. tomorrow. And um, I think all of you are familiar with Brother Browder. Uh, you, if, if not, I see he has some of his works out here laid out for you. Uh, Nile Valley Civilization, Survival Strategies, from the Browder file, and a bunch of tapes. I ask you to please make sure that you uh, support him by purchasing those things. Also support our brother in the back, Brother Rahim. He has books. And also Brother Kamau has tapes from other CMOTAP programs. When the program is finished, downstairs we have a meal. We ask you to come down and join us with that, and we can continue the conversation downstairs. So without any uh, further delay, let me welcome to the microphone this giant, Brother Dr. Anthony Browder. Thank you. Hotep family, it is a pleasure and an honor to, to be here and to be in the city that Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark and Dr. Jackson and so many other giants helped to put on the map and ensure that his soul remained intact. I'm sorry that I'm not going to have an opportunity to share this day with Sister Betty, who I've been in communication with over the last month to make arrangements for my visit here, but uh, she is not able to come due to a uh, funeral that she has to go to. But um, she is certainly here in spirit. And before I get started, I also want to acknowledge uh, a sister who is no longer here, a sister who is now an ancestor, Sister Leola Maddox, uh, who, uh, through UAM, uh, brought me to New York on the regular. And her sudden passing comes as a shock to everyone who knew her and loved her, and that uh, we will surely miss her. And uh, we honor and treasure all those things that she lived for, that she worked so hard for, and we have an obligation and responsibility to see to it that uh, her work continues, or uh, the UAM work continues in her absence. It's going to be difficult, but uh, it's important that when critical personalities who are uh, heads of organizations pass, that the organization itself does not pass when they leave. So we have to train our replacements in order to ensure that any endeavor that we create outlives us. Uh, that should be our job. That should be foremost among the things that we do. So uh, again, I'm pleased to be here, pleased that you all uh, came out to hear what I'm going to be sharing over the course of, of two days. And uh, I was asked by a sister uh, a little while ago if I was going to do the same presentation today <coughs> that I plan to do at the Clark House. Uh, tomorrow, and I told her no, it wasn't my intention to do so. As a matter of fact, uh, I really, since I'm in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, among a group of people who are very sensitive as to how people of African ancestry are depicted in the media, I wanted to do a presentation that I just did last week for the first time. I wanted to share that with you all. I think it's relevant, uh, but I wanted to uh, survey the audience and make sure that that su suggestion meets with your approval. So um, a show of hands for those who would like for me to do a discussion and analysis of the film Get Out. Am I interested? Yeah? All right, all right, well, thank you. <laughs> well, with that, um, let me turn on my, my laptop, my PowerPoint. I already had to queue it up because something just told me you all were going to say yes. <laughs> so thank you for confirming that, that inner spirit that has always guided me uh, and has never led me down uh, a wrong path. So let me start up my laptop and uh, we'll get the party started. So if you want, you can, you can kill any of these lights to make sure that the images are good. 
uh, folk can see the images. So this is uh, just my second time doing this presentation, so excuse me if I refer to my notes. I want to make sure that I, I don't miss any of the, um, the information relative to this film. So <clears throat> for those who know me, know that I've done a series of, uh, of lectures and presentations on the media. Um, and some of the most memorable presentations that I've done have been uh, Decoding the Secret of the Secret uh, 11 years ago, uh, Avatar, uh, Precious, uh, Django Unchained, uh, 12 Years a Slave, uh, The Butler, and just last year I did a presentation on Empire. So even though most people know me as a writer, as a historian, as a lecturer, uh, with an emphasis on Nile Valley culture and civilization, my formal training, my degree, is in graphic design and advertising. Um, have a master's of fine arts, and I had uh, my own graphics design studio for a number of years before I began writing and lecturing. And so one of the talents and one of the gifts that I have is that I interpret history through the eyes of an artist. Uh, I'm formally trained as an artist, and so when I see things, when I see buildings, when I see structures, when I read materials, I always see them through the eyes of an artist. Uh, I see images, I see symbols, I see things that speak to me on another level. So this is the experience that I brought to my interpretation of films. I remember Avatar, when Avatar came out a number of years ago, uh, Avatar I think it was one of the greatest films ever made. Uh, on a technological level, it, it, it raised the bar. Uh, but what I found is that a number of, of our folk were offended by the movie in that they said it, it uh, recreated a lot of the stereotypes that we see in movies. A white man goes into a community inhabited by indigenous people and he rises to the top and he saves them, blah, 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 blah. Yes, that is there, but that's not the whole movie. The movie is layered. And so what I found was that by digging deep and dealing with some of the symbolic elements within that film, it caused people to see the film through an entirely different lens. So that's, that's one of the talents that, that, that I bring to my analysis of films that depict us. Because I want us to begin to move beyond just the superficial and get to, get to the deep substance of films that have a favorable impact on our lives. So as an artist, um, I really look at things from my own personal experiences and what I know through dealing with advertising and marketing is that all media is designed to get you to do three things. One, to sit down. Two, oops, sit down. Make sure, ba, 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 ba. sit down to pay attention and to spend your money. That's the whole purpose of the media. Everything is designed to separate you from your wallet. And the people who, who specialize in advertising and marketing study human behavior, and they know you better than you know yourselves. They know how to get inside of your head, manipulate your heart such that you feel compassion or you feel a desire for certain things. And it's that desire, that compassion, that causes you to spend money to purchase certain products. And so as an artist, as a cultural historian, uh, my job is to educate you so that you can become an educated consumer of media content. And regarding any media, my philosophy is that the philosophy that you possess when you sit down to watch a film or to, to read a magazine or to listen to music, the, the consciousness that you possess is the consciousness through which you will internalize that which you are watching, that which you are listening to, that which you are reading. So the key is to expand your consciousness, because if you only have a thimble-sized consciousness, you can only retain a thimble amount of information. So the more you expand your consciousness, the deeper you can go, the deeper and broader your understanding of what it is you are consuming. So as people of African ancestry, we often have been taken advantage of and exploited by others who manipulate us emotionally. And we've got to move beyond just allowing ourselves to be moved here and there by others who may not have our own best interests at heart, but begin to become critical thinkers of what it is we are uh, consuming. So, uh, so let's get into it. Let's look at this uh, picture, uh, Get Out. Get Out is the directorial debut of Jordan Peele, who is one half of the comedy duo of Key and Peele. Now, to be honest with you, I've never watched Key and Peele. 
Uh, I saw one episode they did, <coughs> which turned me off, and I said, I don't have a desire to watch this because I'm very, I'm very conscientious about what it is I watch, what it is that I listen to. I don't just listen to anything. And, and so I was initially skeptical about seeing this film until several people whose opinion I value and appreciate told me, Tony, you know, you need to see this film. I really would like to hear your critique of this film. And so I went to see it, <coughs> and I found it to be much better than I anticipated. And as I was preparing this presentation uh, for, uh, for Baltimore last week, I spent a lot of time watching the film. I saw, I saw the film about four times. I read numerous articles and dug down and got some research and found some good information that allowed me to see the film through a different lens. And so that's what I want to talk about this afternoon. Uh, Gordon, uh, Jordan Peele is the writer of Get Out, which has been marketed as a comedy horror film. But I think that that depiction or description of the film is kind of misleading because it's really a sat satirical thriller that depicts the horrors of a black man living and loving in post-racial America. The film contains just enough humor to make the horror of American racism palatable to the audience. See, his motivation for writing this film was uh, immediately after Obama was elected in 2008. And all the media started talking about uh, we're now living in a post-racial society. Well, it just so happens that uh, Jordan Peele, his comedy partner, Keegan-Michael Key, and Barack Obama are all mulattoes. They all have white mothers. And one of the things that disturbed me about, uh, about this comedy sketch, this comedy duo, was that I was kind of offended by the fact that here we have uh, mixed race, two mixed race comedians uh, representing Af the African-American experience, which I knew was flawed. And, and uh, again, to, to go back and, and cite the one skit that I saw that offended me was a skit where they played two enslaved Africans on the auction block. And they were upset because they never got bought. That offended me. I cannot imagine a Jewish comedian doing a skit about a Jew who complained because he was never sent to the gas chamber. So their comedy, to me, depicted a lack of sensitivity about things that are important to me, important to us. But so I never watched the show, was hesitant about seeing the film. But once I saw the film, I began to realize that there were other things going on and that my opinion of Jordan Peele uh, has changed because I think he has changed. So Get Out was released on February 24th of this year. And the weekend that it was released, it was the number one movie in America, which means a whole lot of folk saw that movie. And it made a whole lot of money. So let's just look at the, uh, the stats regarding the film. The film costs $4.5 million to make, which is cheap by Hollywood standards, $4.5 million. But it made $33.4 million its first weekend. The audience that first week was 38% African American, 35% white, 27% other, which means that 62% of non-African Americans saw this film and helped to make this film the number one film in the box office. So it wasn't necessarily a black film, even though it had a black protagonist. It wasn't necessarily a black film because most of the actors in the film were white. So it was crafted in such a way that non-African Americans could see the film but yet identify with the protagonist and, and experience some of what he experienced uh, regarding racism in America, which I thought was, was, was pretty clever. So after eight weeks in the box office, Get Out has grossed $163.8 million in North America and Canada. Worldwide, it has grossed $13.8 million for a worldwide gross of $177.6 million, which is a 3,851% return on investment. That's a hell of a return on investment, right? Which means that he's made a whole lot of money, and Hollywood is going to give him plenty of other opportunities to make more films to make more money. Because Hollywood, because show business is 5% show, 95% business. And it's all about the box office. It's all about getting meat in the seats. That's the only thing that matters to them. 
So he has made a whole lot of folk, or a handful of folk, a whole lot of money. And he'll be given other opportunities to do the same. So let me do a quick survey. How many of you all have seen the film Get Out at least once? Raise your hands. Say almost half, half of you all. How many of you all have seen the film at least twice? Raise your hand. Fewer numbers of people. OK. Well, <clears throat> Jordan Peele said that in order to really appreciate this film, you have to see it at least twice. You have to see it twice because of all of the Easter eggs that he hid in the film. Things, very subtle things in the film that you'll miss seeing it the first time, watching a second or a third time, you begin to see things that you didn't see the first time and the film even makes more sense. And you're able to get a, a, a bit more appreciation for, um, for how skillfully crafted this film is. What's also significant is that Jordan Peele is also the director of the film. This is his directorial debut. So it's the first uh, directorial film by an African American that has grossed over $100 million. So he has tapped into something, and he's made a lot of money. He's a very skillful writer, a very skillful director, and the box office proves that. So I want to show a trailer of the film for those of you all who haven't seen it. For those of you who have seen it, this will be a little reminder of what the film is all about. And then I'll get in to an examination of the multiple Easter eggs that are in this film. Is that OK? Yeah. All right, so let's um, check out the trailer. You got your toothbrush? Check. Do you have your deodorant? Check. Do you have your cozy clothes? Got that. What? Do they know I'm black? Should they? You might wanna, you know. Mom and Dad, my black boyfriend will be coming up this weekend. I just don't want you to be shocked that he's a black man. <laughs> I ain't never seen you like this before, bro. Meet family, taking road trips. Don't come back all bougie, man. Come back, get your damn pants up to your damn stomach. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys coming up from the city? Yeah, we're just heading up for the weekend. Can I see your license, please? He wasn't driving. I didn't ask who was driving. I asked to see his ID. Call me Dean and you're hungry, my man. So how long has this been going on, this, this thing? <laughs> <laughs> we hired Georgina and Walter to help care for my parents. When they died, I couldn't bear to let them go. smoke in front of my daughter. I'm gonna quit. She'd take care of that for you. How? Hypnosis. I'm good, actually. Are you ready for this? I'm back in the B. So look, I go do my research. Apparently, a whole bunch of brothers been missing in this suburb. But it's cool. Bro, how you not scared of this, man? Couldn't see no brother around here. Chris was just telling me how he felt much more comfortable with my being here. Yo. Sorry, man. Get out! Yo! <laughs> Rose, we gotta go. Is everything okay? Rose, the keys. Just get the keys. I don't know where they are. Rose! Sink into the floor. Wait, 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 wait. Sink. So that's the trailer. So after watching the film <clears throat> two or three times, you can begin to see how layered the story is and how intricate the trap is that is set for Chris. So I want to focus on uh, nine important facts about the film and share with you some of the uh, backstory behind some of these elements. Fact number one, music is my sanctuary. The soundtrack played during the first five minutes of this film basically tell you the whole story. See, because when you're doing a film, every aspect of every film or every aspect of everything that you see in the media is there 
for a purpose. It has value whether you are conscious of it or not. Every object that you see placed in the screen, all the music, all the sounds that you hear are designed to evoke some reaction within you whether you are conscious of it or not. So if you, think about, if you think about a film, one of the things that I like to do when I watch films, I like to watch the credits. Because traditionally, when we see a film, we focus on the stars, the you know, handful of people, a dozen people who may be the stars of the movie. But if you watch the credits, you notice there are literally hundreds of names that scroll down the screen. Those are the people who are working behind the camera to make the actors or the actresses look good. If it wasn't for these technicians, these people behind the scenes, the film would not be a film. You've got to edit it. You've got to do the sound editing. You've got to do the mixing. You've got to do all of these things to make a film engaging. And so I'm, I'm always interested in, in watching how artists do their thing and acknowledging and appreciating what artists do. So the soundtrack to this movie is important in that it tells you, as I said in the first five minutes, what this film is all about. The film opens with uh, Andre, this brother, walking around in the neighborhood looking for somebody he's lost when he's kidnapped, right, by the brother, Jeremy. And Jordan Peele said that he wrote that scene into the film after the murder of Trayvon Martin. And so that particular scene was to represent what happens to black men, how easily picked off they can be. And there's, there's no response. It's just black men, so nobody cares. But that film opens with uh, Jeremy who's driving a white car and wearing a knight's helmet. And the tune that is blasting from his, from his stereo is a tune uh, entitled Run, Rabbit, Run. Now, what does that mean? Andre is the rabbit. The brother is the rabbit who is being hunted by Jeremy who is wearing a knight's helmet and driving a white car. So why a knight's helmet? Why a white car? If you're gonna kidnap somebody, why would you drive a white car unless it's all symbolic? A white knight, or the white knights were the most violent branch of the Ku Klux Klan. The white knights of the Ku Klux Klan, all right? And the idea of a black man being hunted like a rabbit, all tied into this idea of hunting black people was sport for white folk. They would hunt us down like rabbits. Hence the song, Run, Rabbit, Run. And to reinforce that theme, if you all remember, when Chris got to the Armitage, Armitage's house for dinner, what did the mother, Missy, serve them for dessert? Any of you all remember what she served them for dessert? Yeah. Rabbit cake. <laughs> right? I mean rabbit cake, carrot cake. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Same thing. All right? So these are very subtle things that tell a larger story if you're keyed into the larger story. And then after Andre is kidnapped, there's a soundtrack that plays during the opening credits. And that soundtrack has a very haunting melody. Now Jordan said that he wanted an original tune that would have an African flavor to it and so he left the, uh, the writer to come up with this tune. And the title of the tune is Sikazili uh, Kwaweheli, which is a Swahili phrase that means listen to your ancestors. All right? Listen to your ancestors. So the whole story is about a black man who's in an interracial relationship with a white woman, right? And he gets kidnapped. But the opening music to the film is a Swahili song that says, listen to your ancestors. And the chorus, the chorus or the lyrics to the song say, something bad is happening, run. So if he had listened to his ancestors, then the movie would have been over within the first five minutes. And he wouldn't have had this hit on his hands. So I want to play, to you a, a play for you a segment of, uh, of this song, listen to your ancestors and you can download this online and, and hear the entire song but this is from um, a video a music video
they're telling them from the, from the get-go, something bad is coming, run. Chris is a black man who's in a, who's in a five-month relationship with a white serial killer. And I mean, to him, he is her next victim. So if he was grounded to his ancestors, then he wouldn't have been in a relationship and he wouldn't have jeopardized his life. And so essentially that song is telling him, you know, you're in a bad relationship. This chick is crazy. You need to get out. You need to get out. But again, if he had, it would have been a very short movie, right? So after the opening credits, you then see stills of Chris's photography on the walls of his apartment, or somewhere in New York. It may have been Brooklyn, I think. I think, I think he did live in Brooklyn. Right? So you see stills of his photography hanging on the wall, and the sound, the, the music that plays in the background is um, Redbone by Childish Gambino. Right? And Jordan said that one of the reasons why he selected that song is because of the lyrics are tied to the, uh, the film. So I'll play a short segment of the song just so you can see how the soundtrack interweaves some of the deeper messages in the film. Stay woke. So the essence of this, the songs is about a brother who's unconscious, who's not woke. And as a consequence of him not being connected, he's headed for trouble. So one of the takeaways is, you know, it pays to be connected. It pays to be culturally grounded. It pays to have your eyes and your ears and your heart and your soul open so that you can protect your life and not move down a path or walk down a path that is going to cause you problems in the long term. Fact number two, what's love got to do with it, all right? So the issue is Chris is unconscious and he's out of touch with his African roots. He is literally sleeping with the enemy and he doesn't have, have a clue of who he's dealing with or what he's in for. So we meet Chris and Rose as they're preparing to go to her parents' house uh, for the weekend to meet the parents. And Chris asks the quintessential question, uh, do your parents know that I'm black. Of course they do. That's why Rose picked him, because he's black. So he's being played from the very beginning. And he does not have a clue. Because they're only interested in selecting black folk for the game that they're running. And on the drive up, <clears throat> they hit a deer, which the hitting of the deer reminds Chris of his mother, who was killed in a hit and run accident when he was 11 years old. But while the cop is there to investigate the accident, he then uh, does what some cops do, and he asks Chris for his ID, right, which was totally uncalled for. Chris's white girlfriend, Rose, stands up for his man, and she challenges the cop. Chris thinks he did it. She did it because she's in love with him, right? She's standing up for a man, but in fact, she did it because she didn't want to have a record or a paper trail of Chris having been up there on the road. So she was actually covering her behind. It had nothing to do with him. He did not have a clue. And then they get to her parents' house. She meets, he meets Rose's father, Dean, who then goes into this diatribe about his hatred of deer. Oh, you kill one deer, one deer down, 100,000 more to go. He hates deer, right? So if you think about that, another term for deer, a male deer, is a buck. Another disparaging term for black men is black bucks. So what the father is really saying is that he has a deep-seated hatred for black men, which is why the family is all in on kidnapping black men. So ultimately, if you follow the movie, ultimately, and for those of you, you all who haven't seen the film already, 
I've already spoiled it for you, but that's okay. The brother in the back is selling DVDs, so you can take the DVD home and watch the movie and get a better appreciation for the movie now, right? So ultimately, Dean, the father, is killed by Chris, a black buck, buck who literally kills him with uh, the antlers of a stuffed deer, right? <laughs> so you know, he's adding, he's adding um, um, fuel to the fire, right, so to speak. So fact number four is the help. When Chris is given a tour of the house by the father, the father shows him a picture of Jesse Owens. And he shares with him that his father, Roman Armitage, lost in the Olympic trials, 1936 Olympic trials, he lost to Jesse Owens and didn't get to go to the Olympics to compete against Hitler in Berlin. And they said, or Dean said, his father never got over it. Now that's, that's a key statement. His father never got over it, right? So, and then Dean goes on to explain the presence of the help. He goes on to explain the presence of, um, of Georgina and, and Walter, who he said, we hired Georgina and Walter to help care for my parents. And when they died, I couldn't bear to let them go. All right? He couldn't bear to let them go. The truth is that Rose brought Walter and George to the house so that their grandparents' brains could be implanted in their bodies. That's why Dean couldn't stand to let his parents go. You got it? So it wasn't that he was talking about Walter and Georgina. He couldn't stand to let his parents go. So he kidnapped these two black folk and stole their brains and put their brains into his parents' bodies so that they could still be with him. You get it? All right? So, fact number four, the 100-yard dash. So Chris goes out, first night there, Chris goes out, have a cigarette, everybody's sleeping, and he sees the grandfather, Walter, sprinting towards him and freaks out. But the grandfather is sprinting in Walter's body. Why? Because he never got over the loss to Jesse Owens. So he's still racing. He's still practicing his run, all right? Chris then gets sidelined when the mother, Missy, hypnotizes him. And in the process of talking to him as the psychiatrist that she was, she taps into his deepest fear. And that deep fear that he carries around with him is the fear of an 11-year-old boy sitting at home watching television when his mother was on her way home from, from work, walking in the rain, was hit by a car and left on the side of the road and died. And he sat there at home watching television and did nothing. So he feels responsible for her death and he carries this pain with him. And, and so Missy then um, sends him to the sunken place, this sunken place within his psyche, within his soul, where he lives with his pain forever. And we find out later that this whole idea of the sunken place is phase one, the first step in the process of the brain transplantation. So the boy is being played from the time he said he walked into the house. The sunken place is also a metaphor for the back door or the trap door that Dr. Carter G. Woodson wrote about in his book, The Miseducation of the Negro, when he said, when you control a person's thinking, you don't have to worry about their actions. You don't have to send them here or there, but they will find their proper place and they will stay in it. And if there is no, you, can, you don't have to order that person to the back door of any society. And if there is no back door, they will create one for their special purposes. Right? So the sunken place represents this back door that we all are programmed to feel comfortable in. All right? So y'all starting to get this? The psychological aspects of this movie are, are really interesting, really interesting. Uh, fact number five, bid them in, right? The auction. The auction. So at the annual party, which we find out later, is actually an auction, and the guests who are bidders at the auction are checking out the merchandise. Chris, he has no idea what's going on. And so they feel in his muscles to see how strong he is. 
The woman is checking out his package to see if it's true what they say about black men. Other guy is, is checking out his golf, uh, golf swing and telling him, you know, I know Tiger, right? So he's interested in his body so he can use his body to play golf. The woman is checking out his package because she wants him to replace her husband, right? So all of this stuff is going on and we don't have a clue the first time you watch the film. But everybody that's part of that organization is there for a specific purpose, to bid on the black body that one of them is going to purchase and ultimately inhabit. Right? That's something else, man. That really is something else. So Chris then gets suspicious after his altercation with Logan. And he takes his photograph, you know, he's trying to be cool with his, with his cell phone and takes a picture, but the flash goes off, right? And the flash allows Andre, who is the brother trapped inside of the body that the white man is not controlling, that flashlight allows Andre to come back. If only for a few minutes, he comes back, he starts bleeding, and then he runs towards Chris and says, get out, get out. He's not antagonistic, he's not upset, he's trying to save his life. But we don't realize that at first blush. And so the other thing that's interesting is that the flashlight caused Andre to remember. The flashlight caused Andre to remember, to remember who he was. And so a flashlight is, is, a, is a metaphor for light, which is enlightenment, which is knowledge. And it also kind of reminds me of Parliament Funkadelic and their song Flashlight, <laughs> shine the spotlight on them. <laughs> Dealing with Sir Noah's Devoid of Funk, you know, trying to bring some soul, some rhythm to Sir Noah's Devoid of Funk. So it was a nice uh, use of the term. So after, <clears throat> after all of this, after all of these warnings, Chris is finally starting to get woke, right? And now he finally realized that he does need to get out. And while he's discussing with Rose whether or not he will leave with her or without her, his fate is already sealed. His fate is already sealed at the silent auction where he's now sold to the highest bidder. Have you all ever heard that um, Oscar Brown Jr. song, Bitter Men, Bitter Men, Bitter Men? That could have been the soundtrack for this scene. And it was, it, you know, and the thing about it was that, you know, watching the movie the first time, you had no idea what was going on. They're holding the bingo cards, but they're actually bidding for this brother in a silent auction, right? In a silent auction. So, fact six, party clothes. During the auction scene, the party, the auction scene, you notice that many of the guests are wearing red. You see red on the woman's dress, a little red in the blouse. Uh, the man has some red on, the woman has red glasses. He's got a red tie, he's got a red handkerchief, she's got red. So these guests are, are, are all wearing red. So, pardon me? <laughs> very good, very good. So, and Chris is wearing blue. So could it be that the red and blue is a metaphor for symbolic of uh, red and blue states? And red stands for the red racist Republicans and blue stands for the blue dumb Democrats. <laughs> and then you notice during the party when uh, Chris and Rose are sitting together, Rose is wearing this uh, white and, and actually it's light gray and, and red striped uh, top. And sitting together, what do they look like sitting together? They look like the flag, don't they? They look like the flag, right? And, and so Chris is the patch of blue in the upper right-hand corner of the flag. And if you all recall, the flag has 50 five-pointed stars. And the five-pointed star is a star that represents man. Um, and the fact that there's 50 five-pointed stars in the US flag represents the 50 people who inhabit the 50, the 50 people, the 50 residents who inhabit the 50 states, right? So all of this is symbolic and all of this tells a story. Once you drill down a little deeper. Fact number seven, the party's over, right? The party is over. Chris finds out too late that the party is over and that the whole Armitage family is in on the deal. They all in on the setup. Misty sends him to the sunken place and when he wakes up, he's strapped to a chair, 
sitting in front of an old-fashioned television set. And you hear, coming from the speakers in the television, the phrase, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> Tagline of the uh, United Negro College Fund, right? A mind is a terrible thing to waste, as they're getting ready to take out his mind, as they've done to so many others before him. So Grandpa Armitage appears on the TV screen and begins to tell Chris the story of what they're in for. He begins to talk about the uh, coagula procedure which he perfected with his own hands. This procedure by which he as a neurosurgeon and his son is also a neurosurgeon can transplant the brain of uh, a European into the body of an African, thereby giving the Europeans immortality in a black body. And there is an organization called the Order of the Coagula, which is all about supporting this endeavor. And they come to these annual meetings in order to select the next black person whose body somebody is going to purchase and inhabit. All right? So the whole film and race issues are best summed up in a four-minute conversation between Chris and Jim, the white man who won Chris's body at the auction. So if you just listen to this four-minute conversation, it tells a very chilling story about race in America. So I want to play this clip for you and, and just take note of the satirical approach to race relations in the United States that is embedded in this four-minute clip, OK? Stronger, faster, cooler, black, 
So that one line is chilly. I want your eyes, man. I want those things you see through. That's all he wanted. So Chris is stuck, strapped in a chair, wishing he had gotten out a long time ago, but he's stuck. And then he looks down at the chair and he sees where he's picked apart the, the leather in the chair and sees the cotton sticking out. And then he finally hears his ancestors. He hears the voices of his cotton-picking ancestors, right? <laughs> takes the cotton, puts it in his ears, so he's no longer um, uh, hypnotized by the sound of the teacup, and he's able to escape, right? So the essence of the plan is, is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Phase one is hypnosis. The psychiatrist hypnotizes him and sends him into that sunken place. Phase two is mental preparation, psych psychological pre-op where he now tells him, this is what the deal is, and I'm preparing your body to receive my mind so that I can better control you. And pay, phase three is the transplantation, which leaves the host in a limited consciousness as a passenger in the sunken place within his or her own body and mind. That's a hell of a metaphor for a lot of folk that you all know who live their lives in the sunken place and have no idea that they're there. So I can just imagine, I can just imagine what um, Dr. Francis Welsing would say about this movie. I mean, I really, I really <laughs> wish that she could talk about this and the current president, you know? But she prepped us for this because she told us all along what was coming. And she said that if you don't understand the nature of racism and white supremacy, she and Neely Fuller said that if you don't understand the nature and manifestations of racism and white supremacy, then everything that you think you understand will only confuse you. And there's a lot of confused folk out here because they didn't listen, because they didn't get woke until it's too late. So after all of this, Chris finally gets woke and realizes that he needs to get out. And he then prepares to free himself. Now, the interesting thing is, is that while he's downstairs in the basement grappling with all of this stuff, his girlfriend, the love of his life, <laughs> is upstairs in her bedroom chilling. Right, she is chilling. Now, this scene is the scene that uh, Jordan Peele said that he wrote after the movie was already done. They were already shooting the film. And he was watching some material online and decided to rewrite this, this scene. So check out the elements in this scene where Rose is upstairs in a bedroom chilling. She's dressed in white, right? And she's listening to a song from the movie Flashdance, I've Had the Time of My Life. <laughs> all right, so she doesn't give a damn about Chris or all the other black lives that she's destroyed. Uh, she's having the time of her life. She lives to do this, right? And so you notice her drinking milk and eating cereal, right? But the cereal and the milk are separated. The milk is white and the cereal is colored. Huh? So she's keeping, she's keeping the colors separated. She carefully picks a piece of cereal out of the jar and then she sips the milk, right? And so, uh, what Jordan was trying to do with this scene was he was responding to this new thing on the internet where you have these uh, alt-right neo-Nazis in Europe particularly who have this thing about milk. White milk represents white pride. 
because black folk uh, are lactose intolerant and can't consume white milk. And white, and white milk is good for building healthy bones. So they're saying, they're looking at white milk as a sign of privilege, something that, that, that gives them an advantage over black folks. So white milk is now being used by racists as a symbol of their superiority. So he rewrote this scene in order to reflect this current trend in American and worldwide racism. And while she's sitting there having the time of her life, she's on the internet trolling for her next black victims, right? And then she happens to, to stumble upon this image of this brother, this basketball player, who she's going to zero in on as her next love interest, you know? Another interesting sidebar to the film is that that basketball player is Jordan Peele's comedy partner, Keegan-Michael Key. <laughs> All right, so they got a lot of little things in, in, in this movie that, uh, that they can talk about, they can laugh about behind closed doors. But uh, it speaks to the level of thought that went into writing this film. So fact eight, freedom. While Chris is literally in the hot seat, he frees himself by listening to his cotton-picking ancestors plug his ears with cotton so he can't hear that hypnotic spoon hitting the cup, sending him into the sunken place. And I'm still trying to figure out how, if his hands are strapped to the chair, how is he able to take the cotton and put it in his ear? But that's another story. That's something I can overlook. <laughs> you know, don't want to be too critical. But Chris gets free, and he kills the father, he kills the mother, and then he kills the son. And then he takes the son's car keys, gets in the car and starts to drive away, but then he hits the sister, Georgina. And he makes a crucial mistake because he's still dealing with the loss of his mother and goes back to pick up Georgina because she reminds him of his mother who was hit by a car. And he doesn't know that Georgina is really uh, Rose's grandmother, right? So that's why when she wakes up, she tries to kill him because of everything that's going on. So uh, Georgina tries to kill Chris and she dies in a car accident. He makes his way out of the car, and then Rose six grandfather after him. Now, the ending of the movie was also revised, because Jordan said that <clears throat> initially he was going to end this movie like most horror films end, with the hero being killed. How many of you all ever saw the movie, the 1960s movie, The Night of the Living Dead, which was the inspiration for this film, which took place supposedly in Pennsylvania. It was the first movie about zombies, The Walking Dead, and uh, has all white actors and one brother. And uh, they all hold up, the humans are holed up in this house, and the brother rises to the occasion. He saves everybody, right? And then at the end of the movie, after the night of dealing with the zombies, uh, there's, a, there's a party of, of white folk comb in the neighborhood, shooting the zombies and burning their bodies. And they see the brother in the house, and they think that he's a zombie, and they kill him, right? So the brother can't even catch a break. So Jordan was going to uh, incorporate that trope into his film. But then <clears throat> he was thinking about all of the negative response to the election and re-election of Barack Obama and how police went buck wild and just started killing black folk, black men specifically, but nobody was spared. Black men were killed, black women were killed, black children were killed because of America's hatred for the election and re-election of a black man, right? So he decided that he didn't want to end the film on a negative note and send black people out of the theater with the brother losing again. So he decided to uh, change the ending. And as you all saw the film, Rose, uh, sick grandpa after Chris as he's trying to run down the road. Grandpa tackles Chris. And as they're struggling on the ground, Chris pulls out his cell phone, flashes the light into grandpa's, uh, grandpa's uh, face. And Walter comes back to consciousness. And he turns to Rose and says, give me the gun. And then he shoots her, right? And then he kills himself because it's the only way that he can kill grandfather, right? And so <clears throat> while you're watching all of this, uh, Rod then comes to the rescue, driving up in the TSA police car. But Chris, the, the, the interesting thing about how the scene was shot, 
Chris is strangling his, his white girlfriend when he sees the police car lights coming down the road and he stops, puts his hands up in the air because he knows what's next. He knows he's a goner but he's believed to find out that it's his boy Rod coming to his rescue, right? So 